You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Reproductive psychiatry, integrative medicine, or just someone to talk to. Dr. Carly is here to provide moms with personal solutions so they may experience physical and emotional well-being and find joy in motherhood. Please welcome the host of MD for Moms, Dr. Carly Snyder. Welcome. You are listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. I'm a reproductive and perinatal psychiatrist, meaning I work with women struggling with emotional symptoms throughout their reproductive years. I'm also mom to three kids of my own. This show, MD for Moms, is dedicated to helping women enjoy life more, to maximizing health and wellness, and to improving women's relationships with themselves and with others. I'm going to remind you throughout the show, you are more than welcome to call in with any question or thought you may have. The number is 866 451 one four five one. So we are returning to our much loved Mama Docs on Call series where I introduce you to physicians who are moms like me, and they're here to provide information and support geared to you and your family. And, you know, today we're going to talk about a really interesting topic, um, being childhood obesity, but also just childhood weight and food and, you know, how do you address your child's eating without inherently leading to um, either battle about food or, you know, in, uh, eating sort of behavior, all of that. Um, we have pediatrician, mom, and childhood obesity specialist, Dr. Elizabeth Vander here. And I'm really excited about this because I think this is one of those topics that isn't discussed enough, but is on people's minds. So I'm psyched. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> So, I mean, I said, you know, I said you're a pediatrician, but you, you have like this cool specialty. Um, can you tell us about it? Well, um, I think that, you know, I, I grew up in a Hispanic household. You know, my parents were Cuban and um, obesity is a, a significant problem in the Hispanic and the black community. And growing up, you know, I we rarely talked about healthy foods. I mean, we ate what we like to eat and um, every celebration revolved around food. And um, I never really thought too much about it. And I think um, with my patients, what I'm finding is that a lot of us don't really understand a lot about food and our bodies. And obesity is something that it's not only how you look, it really affects so much more than that. And it's a crisis right now in our country. I mean, kids are gaining weight more rapidly than ever. And this year in particular with COVID, um, for their checkups, I'm seeing kids gaining 20 to 30 pounds mm. in a year. Oh my God, that's a lot of weight. Yeah. And it's very concerning wow. because this is, you know, this is the beginning of problems for these kids later on and in their future. So um, that's that's kind of why it's the interest for me. I've always been interested in, you know, the whole child, you know, the, the mind and the body combination. And obesity is one of those things that it's complicated. I mean, there's a lot of factors that contribute to obesity, but there's a lot of things that we can do about it. And parents just need to be educated, I think. I think sometimes they just don't even know where to start. I, I think that is so true. So... 
I guess it's important that we just sort of, with definition wise, what is considered obese for children? Is it like with adults where, you know, if you have a BMI above whatever it is, 24, 25, I don't even know, 25, 26, you're considered obese. What's the barometer that you use? Well, in kids, um, we use the BMI as well. After the age of two, we actually start to calculate the BMI. Um, But it's not as simple as a calculation where you just get a number and then you decide if someone's obese because um, kids are growing and they're developing. So their their number is actually compared to their peers, their kids, kids that are their same age, their same sex. So um, I actually on my website, I have a page dedicated to that where parents can go in and they can um, calculate their child's BMI and then... um, then you can kind of look at the chart to see where exactly your child falls, whether they fall into the normal range, into the obese range, or underweight. Um, But basically, obesity is defined as greater than the 85th percentile um, for BMI compared to other kids of the same age and sex. And what, you know, what are the dangers, right? Because as you said, it's not just what you look like, although... I'm sure part of, you know, the danger for children is also being bullied, right, as yeah. an extension, because kids are nasty and awful to each other. Um, but from a physical standpoint, what are the dangers of obesity in kids? Well, the problem is that if, if kids are obese, they have a much higher chance of developing, of staying obese as adults. And um, even in young adults and teenagers, we're seeing um, type 2 diabetes, we're seeing high blood pressure, we're seeing fatty livers, we're seeing um, high cholesterol. And if these things start happening early on, you know, by the time that these kids are adults in their 40s and 50s, you know, they're, they're already um, going on an uphill battle, you know. Um, and then add to that all of the, the mental um, complications that come with obesity, like a lack of self-esteem, um, lower self-confidence, the bullying, like you mentioned, for the kids, um, it, it, it starts to um, really affect the kids in more ways than we actually think. It's so much more than just the physical. I mean, the physical is the least significant part of it. It's so much more than that. <clears throat> and what it, what are the biggest contributors for obesity in kids, right? I mean, meaning when you see an obese child, is it more often than not that the parents are as well, that where it's an issue of everyone's eating unhealthfully and genetics are at play? Or um, is this more an issue of, you know, a kid who really likes to play video games and isn't exercising and just sits there and eats Cheetos? What what are the factors yeah. that you find most important or, or more, most consequential? Yeah, I mean, it's multifactorial. I mean, of course, genetics comes into play for sure, and that's obviously something that we can't really do anything about, not yet anyway. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. Our environment is, of course, another factor. Um, The socioeconomic status of the family as well. Unfortunately, the lower-income families with Blacks and Hispanics being in the higher group, they also have a higher risk of obesity. Um, And it's the truth that 50%, um, if if you have one parent who's obese, you have a 50% chance of being obese. If both parents are obese, the kids have an 80% chance of being obese. So um, it's really um, something that I think the parents really need to, to take a step back and educate themselves and not just kind of go by what they learned as kids. I mean, um, you know, we all grow up differently. We grow up in different cultures with different ideas about food and about health and about exercise. And we need to, as adults, take a step back and educate ourselves and say, wait a minute, you know, are these choices that I'm making the best choices for my family and my kids? And how much are kids supposed to be eating? And what's the portion size for a child this age? Um, And what am I actually buying? Like, what do I have in my house? What am I choosing to eat when I'm stressed or worried? Um, what kind of things am I um, showing my kids as an example? So those are the kinds of things that I think are important as parents 
to help the factors that you that that you have control over and the younger the kids are the better well that was my next question is at what point in this process right like we all think of little chubby babies are like the cutest things in the world right like the the <laughs> baby rolls no everybody loves them but when does that go from being cute as pie to being not healthy um i've had like friends, patients, et cetera, who have said to me that they think that their three-year-old, four-year-old, five, six-year-old, especially daughters, frankly, tend to be the ones who uh-huh. are most identified, look like they're gaining too much weight or they look chubby or whatever the phraseology they use. And I always, in those young ages, you know, say that your kid grow, um, in part, caveat being I know that my patients and friends tend to eat healthy foods overall so but what age is it that where a parent should be concerned about their child's weight see I mean I think that from the moment that a child is aware of food and aware of of just what they're eating I think as parents it's our responsibility to provide healthy options and talk about being healthy. It's not really, um, I don't like to focus on the weight of a child, but explaining to kids that there's reasons that we eat certain foods. I mean, that some foods might taste good and they're okay for an occasional treat, but those are not good for our bodies. They're not nourishing our bodies and they're not fueling us and giving us the right kind of energy. So we need to teach the kids, even from a very young age, that food is for fuel. I mean, it's, it's to keep us healthy and to give us energy. It's not just what we like to eat and, and, and what tastes better. Um, so I think that's why it's important to go for your yearly checkups with your doctor so that you can see the trend for the growth and the weight of that specific child. Um, and it's a great way to start talking to kids about it. When they go to the doctor's office, if they're starting to see that the child is gaining weight, that's the perfect time to say, you know what, you know, this is kind of like your body's way of saying, wait a minute, something's wrong. You know, we're eating too much or we're not exercising enough or there's a reason why you're falling into the overweight range, which is ideal to catch a child before they're in the obese range. Um, if you can catch them before they're obese and they're just in the overweight range, which is the, you know, between the 85th and 95th percentile. I I think I had said before 85th, but obesity is over the 95th percentile, but overweight is 85th to 95th percentile. So if you can catch those kids there, that's the goal. I mean, so that you can prevent them from reaching that obese range. Now, if you have a child who is not overweight, who, you know, for example, my, my kid, my son, I'm thinking of actually specifically, he's like first to third percentile for weight, always like he's a skinny kid, but he Uh eats, if, if it's up to him, he'd have mac and cheese every night and would skip vegetables. Now I don't let him do that. Um, but how do you recommend people, parents approach the question of food in a kid where it's not an issue of them being overweight? You know, again, I, I, I think as parents, parents, they struggle so much with this and they spend so much mental energy on what kids are eating and um, what they're going to make for dinner and what they're going to make for lunch and what the kids didn't eat or what they're not eating. And it comes with so much guilt and so much um, mental energy. Um, I always tell parents, you know, your job is to provide food. Um, and they decide. So it's like you provide, they decide. Um, you can, you can't force someone to eat. And if you try to force any child to eat, it's going to be a losing battle. You're, you're both going to end up frustrated and the child is always going to relate, um, food to stress and tension. Um, so I think that the most important thing is to, to understand that your job is to provide a variety of foods for that child, whether or not they eat it. I mean, you give it in their plate and if they don't eat it, they don't need it. That's your you don't, job as a parent. 
You don't act like a diner like I do where I have different meals for different kids. Um, exactly. We're going to take a brief <laughs> break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Sender, and we are speaking to pediatrician Dr. Elizabeth Vander. And after the break, we're going to talk about preventing, you know, what's, where's the line in terms of health versus eating disorder and control issues around food? Um, how does our view of food influence and our bodies influence our children? Don't go away. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various business interest through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale. An international initiative called Nurse now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are speaking to Dr. Elizabeth Vander about childhood weight and healthy eating. And we'd love to hear from you. Give us a call, 866-451-1451. So, you know, one thought that, you know, whenever we talk about food, the first thought I think a lot of us come in is diets, right? It's like modification of a normal dietary rhythm. Should people be considering putting their children on diets or is it, you know, should they be paleo or you know, whatever, gluten-free, blah, blah, blah? Or is it better to have a more holistic approach to this? Well, you know, if, if a doctor is recommending a specific diet for a medical problem, that's one thing. But for parents, I think the most important thing is to understand what kids are really supposed to be eating and how much. Um, I think that really being re- realistic with yourself about what kinds of choices your child is making and what cho- choices you're making for your family and 
how active your child is and what other factors could be contributing to the obesity is more important. Um, I never advocate for extreme diets. Um, kids should not be on keto diets or these, these calorie restrictive diets where they're starving all the time. Um, these these um, diets might work for adults in the short term, but we all know that most of people can't sustain those types of diets for long term and they end up going back um, to their usual habits, which is kind of like this ongoing cycle. I mean, statistically, half of adults are on some kind of diet, quote unquote. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's um, ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So I think, you know, your time is better spent really self-reflecting and spending some time and really doing the research to understand, okay, my child is this weight right now and how many calories should my child be eating and really look and see how, how often is, are they eating? Um, how much are they eating? What kind of choices are you making in your house? What are they snacking on? What are they drinking? I mean, how often are you having Ugh. fast food? You know, 30% of kids have fast food more than three times a week. That's yeah. ridiculous. Um, yeah, and fast, but, fast food is high in calories and low in nutrients. So, um, and, you know, you go to Starbucks and you have a, a frappuccino and that's 500 calories. That's almost half of or a third of the calories a child needs the whole day. <laughs> and it's not even filling. <laughs> so they're starving. In like 20 minutes, they're hungry again and they just had 500 calories. Oh, God. Yeah, you know, I also always think of the kid who, growing up, we all knew a kid like this who, you know, would come over to our house and eat everything because they were so restricted at home. Um, right. And I think that happened, that plays out now as well. I've always had the approach, be it good or bad, like I have, I have really healthy snacks always. But we have, right. you know, there are cookies around. There's, you know, right. I'm diabetic, so we have some candy in case I get my glucose drops. But my kids don't, but because it's available, they're exactly. sort of disinterested. You know, if they're if they want a cookie, they have a cookie, and I really don't care. But right. they're not ravenous for a cookie. There's I, and um, because I mean, I remember being a kid and having a friend who I felt badly for because she was always on a diet, and then yeah. she always broke her diet and felt terribly guilty at my house. And that's just not the way to have you know to for childhood. But what about no, um, when you deprive somebody? When you deprive somebody of something. They want it more. <laughs> it happens yeah. to all of us. As soon as they tell you, oh, you can't have the piece of cake, all of a sudden you want it. You might not have even wanted it to begin with, but all of a sudden now someone told you you can't have it, now you want it even more. So, you know, with kids, are no different. I mean, if you tell a child you can never eat a cookie, then, of course, as soon as, you know, what happens is they start hiding it. You know, when they eat a cookie, they're hiding it. They're hiding it in their room. Like you said, when they go to a friend's house, they, they shove their mouth with cookies. And, and it should never be a feeling of, guilt. Um, these things taste good. I mean, and we like them, you know, it's okay, you know, but understanding that these kinds of foods are not healthy for us and are not good for our bodies is what's most important. And explaining to kids like, um, okay, you decided to have that ice cream or we had this ice cream when we went out to lunch, so we can't have dessert tonight for dinner. You know, you have to pick and choose. Or if you decided to have that dessert, then you can't have the shake. You know, kind of pick one or the other, you know, because if not, that's just a lot of empty calories that are not healthy for our bodies. I think focusing on what's healthy for us um, and also teaching kids to pay attention to how they feel when they eat. You know, like if your child eats a lot of sugar and all of a sudden they're falling asleep on the couch, that's a great time to kind of say, yeah, you know, sometimes when we eat a lot of sugar, it gives us like that little short term boost of energy. But then a little later you get like really tired. And it's really hard to focus, you know, and kind of teaching kids to make that connection is so valuable because when they eat healthy foods, they feel better. They're more energetic. Um, they're not falling asleep. They fall, they sleep better at night, you know, so making that connection for them, I think is one of the most important tools that parents um, can, can give to kids. That, I mean, I, I yeah, it sounds, um, and it's not that hard. I mean, basically, no. you know, it, now, how about, I mean, uh, how influential 
our parents in the setting of like, you know, if mom is always saying, I look fat, or mom says, I'm on a diet, or, you know, whatever, or if dad says that, right? Um, yeah. How much does this stuff penetrate kids and lead to like unhealthy body image? Yeah, I think I think um, it absolutely affects them. I mean, kids from the time that they're little, whether or not you realize it, they're they're looking at everything that you say, everything that you do, um, the choices that you're making, how you talk to other people, and how you treat yourself. You know, and I think um, one of the things I've learned as a pediatrician and as a parent is that. You know, in order to be a good mom and in order to be the best person you can be, you really need to take care of yourself first. And that means um, your mental health and your physical health. So teaching kids the importance of taking care of both, how you feel as a person and your physical health is, is the most important thing you can teach them. Because if you don't take care of yourself, your child's not going to take care of themselves or they're not going to think it's a priority. You know, so being careful about what you say about yourself, like um, negative thinking and and negative things you're saying to yourself. And we're teaching our kids that that's the way we're supposed to be talking to ourselves. And it's not. And we're supposed to be our biggest advocates. The whole whole world could be saying bad things about you. You know, you have to be the one that says, oh, you know what? Yeah, I had that ice cream today. Okay, whatever. It was good. But tomorrow I'm going to start eating healthy again. You know, like you know, not beating yourself about about it or saying, you know, horrible things to yourself. You know, some days you have good days and some, some days you have bad days. And that's living. I mean, no one's perfect. And I think the most important thing is progress over perfection and teaching kids that we're doing our best and that we're going to try to make healthy choices for our family and, and not shaming yourself when you make a mistake or do something wrong or feel like you've gained weight, you know, Um, It's what you do with that information that's more important. It's not focusing and saying negative things to yourself. And how much does exercise play in, right? As adults, um, exercise is obviously important, but you can't really easily work out around. If you eat, as you were saying, dessert, like ice cream and a shake, it's pretty hard to work out enough to make that an even split. Um, what about for kids? If, if kids are like running around doing lots and lots of, you know, soccer or basketball, you know, physically um, kind of taxing things, should we be comfortable giving them more calories all the time or only after their games or how does that work? Well, I mean, yes, with, if you're more physically active, generally you need more calories to to maintain your weight. Um, and if you go to websites like myplate.gov, they, they have specific kind of um, like sample quote unquote diets, like that you should be eating, you know, for um, the different ages and the different BMIs. And there is different categories for kids who are sedentary, have moderate activity or extreme activities. Um, but it's never like a catch up. I think the important thing is to let kids um, pay attention to their bodies and their hunger cues. You know, that's another thing that's really important. Um, some kids eat because they're bored or they eat because they're distracted and they're watching TV while they're eating and they ate the entire bag of chips. You know, they're not eating because they're hungry. They're eating because they're distracted or they're bored or um, it's not because it's not because of hunger cues. And that's the other important thing that parents have to teach their kids, you know, stop eating when you're full pay attention to how you feel. Are you hungry? If you're hungry, eat, you know, making healthy choices, but eat when you're hungry. Don't not, don't stop eating because you think you've had enough or finish your entire plate because your parents served you a mountain of food. (laughs) Right. And I guess that's the other, you know, there's that old adage, like, you know, finish your plate before you leave the table, whatever that doesn't really hold. Does it? I mean, I think you just answered the question, but, Oh, and in fact, we have to go to break. So, we're going to hold that question. Um, you're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Sunder. And when we return, 
What do you do if only one kid has a weight issue? How do you address that without making them feel badly? Don't go away. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the BBM Global Network. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality? But it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating. Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like... I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking to pediatrician, Dr. Elizabeth Vander. And if you have a question, give us a call. There is still time, 866-451-1451. So before... I get to the question about if one kid, if there's a discrepancy. I also wanted to pop in this question about should should parents uh, it, should thyroid health be evaluated? Should are there other like primary medical conditions that should be ruled out in the setting of weight gain with kids as with adults? Well, I think um, any big change, I think, whether it's increase in weight or loss of weight, warrants a visit to your doctor. Like if your child has gained a significant amount of weight or lost a lot of weight in a short period of time, that's definitely something you should bring to the attention of your doctor. And um, even though a lot of people check for thyroid problems in kids who are obese, the majority of the times their thyroids are normal. Um, So usually thyroid problems come with other symptoms. Um, and that's where it's important to talk to your doctor about it. But I think when you see a, a shift to whether it's up or down, um, it, it warrants at least a, the question of why is this happening if you haven't done anything to make it happen. Like if you haven't changed an exercise program, you haven't changed the diet, and all of a sudden your child's gaining too much weight or losing weight, um, I definitely think that that should be addressed. That makes sense. Um, now, also, I'm going to ask this before we get to our, our multiple kid question. Girls, you know, tend to put on weight naturally and appropriately in like the beginning stages of puberty. Um, how can parents kind of uh, approach that kind of weight gain, which is healthy and as compared to inappropriate weight gain so that their child doesn't feel at all like, you know, either out of control of their bodies or ashamed or anything else. Yeah, I think that that happens a lot in the office when, and when girls come in, um, sometimes like even just talking about weight, they start crying or they're Mm -hmm. overwhelmed, they're upset when when you even bring up the subject. So you have to be really careful um, how you bring it up. But I think that the most important thing is to explain to them kind of ahead of time that they're not alone, that this happens to most girls, 
Um, but that they're getting older and that that means they start having to take a little bit of ownership for their health um, and understand that they, they're going to stop growing soon. And what that means is that they don't have that benefit of kind of growing and gaining weight. So if they keep gaining weight at the same rate that they were gaining before, then they, they're going to have problems with their weight. You know, so I think like it's just kind of explaining it to them and helping them to understand that this is normal and um, that they need to stay, start taking some ownership for their for their health and letting them decide, you know, like, you know, it's, it's kids know that they're overweight. <laughs> I mean, the kids that are overweight know that they're overweight, you know, um, and I think that's why it's so hard for them to talk about it. Um, so ask them what they think that they can do to change it instead of telling them like, oh, don't eat any more sugar or, oh, you need to exercise more. Or, oh, you need, you know, I, I think the more important thing is to ask them to say, you know, what kind of choices are you making that you think maybe you can change or what are some things that you can um, maybe do differently or is there something that 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 you think is contributing to this? Like make them a part of it, because I think when you give them that power they're going to be more apt to to actually do something. It's, it's so much harder when a mom, you know, not, I have moms and, and it's not, I don't think that they mean it in a harmful way, but they'll, you know, they'll come in and say things like, oh, she's just not genetically blessed. You know, she has <sighs> bad genes, you know, and she inherited these genes and she just has big bones and she's just, you know, the chubby one in the house or, you know, and making comments like that, are, are hurtful and I don't think they mean it in that way but you know kids are when they're growing up they're they're trying to figure out who they are they're trying to define themselves and then they start thinking like oh I'm the chubby one or I'm I'm the one that's not genetically blessed or I'm the one you know the dumb one or the smart one or you know so we have to be really careful about how we approach these things um and, and these conversations especially with girls because you know statistically um, girls are more body shamed than boys, um, which is a real problem. You know, social media doesn't help, you know, with all the unrealistic expectations of what we're supposed to look like. Yeah, and the editing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, now, I, I asked this question before, but we didn't get a chance to answer it. So let's say you have one child. I mean, this fits perfectly into what you're just saying. What if one child is gaining weight faster than another how can parents address that issue without having that kid feel like as you were saying the chubby kid or the you know the one who you know is is struggling and what have you well you know it's interesting because whenever i have siblings in a room you know if i have one child who's overweight and one child who's thin you know, sometimes the thin child will sit there and be like, yeah, you know, you should be eating healthier and you should be eating this and you shouldn't be eating that. And, um, and the, that child usually is just there kind of quiet. <laughs> um, but then I usually quickly turn around to the thin child and say, well, you know, a lot of thin people can have high cholesterol and have health problems, you know, so it's really not just about weight. Um, you know, our food choices and eating healthy is about keeping our bodies healthy. And that's really the most important thing. And for, for families who are dealing with an overweight child, it really has to be a family change. It has to be a lifestyle change. It has to be where families say, we have to make health a priority in our home and really take a look at what you're buying to eat, what kind of food choices you're making. Um, now with COVID parents have, you know, Kids are staying home more and they're doing less exercise. We're all more sedentary. So even just kind of the day to day of going up and down stairs in school or going to work, you know, we're doing a lot less of that. So, you know, we need to start like saying, Hey, you know what, let's go for a walk or let's go for a bike ride. I'm not saying like, Oh, let's go exercise because we have to exercise because you're overweight. You know, like that's not, um, that's not the kind of, you have to make it, that we're making these choices because this is what's good for our bodies. And that's just, this is what's going to make us feel good and it's going to make us healthy long-term and it's going to, it's going to help everything. It's going to help our sleep, our relationships, our, our body image, everything. And so 
it, it, singling out a child is it's not beneficial for anybody, and I think the focus should be on shifting the, the family's mentality on what they should or shouldn't be eating or doing. I mean, that makes sense because otherwise that one kid feels targeted and different, um, and no one And that's that. And that leads to eating disorders. You know, those, those kids have a higher risk of eating disorders because they feel shame, so they'll they'll hide and they'll eat or they'll binge eat and they feel guilty. So they'll vomit or they'll find ways to, um, um, and do you have a higher risk of causing an eating disorder in those kids by doing things like that? And let's say you have a child, I mean, in the same sense, in thinking about eating disorders for a minute, who was overweight and is now thin, how careful should you be about praising them vis-a-vis their weight? Because, it becomes something where now the thinness is the, you know, they're, everyone is like, oh my God, you look amazing. You look amazing. And that can really negatively reinforce uh, body image stuff because what does that mean you look like before? Yeah. And, and I think that that's where parents really, um, and doctors can really play an important role and congratulating the child for making healthy choices. You know, saying, you know what, you you took ownership of this and you said, you know, enough already with not doing exercise or enough with all this junk food I'm eating that's not helping me and my body, you know. Um, and saying, you know, if someone says, wow, you lost so much weight, you know, feel good about it and feel proud of it. But, it, you know, explain to someone if they ask you, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. Like, this is something that I decided for myself. Um, because I wanted to make a change because I didn't feel good or I didn't feel healthy. Um, instead of just praising the look, you know, the, the physical is only one part of all of this. You know, it's so much more. I mean, it's, it's your overall health, your mental health, it's everything. So it's, it's really praising those things as well, you know, and, and letting kids recognize that and see the difference in how they feel so that they can share that with other kids. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I think it's people are so focused on what someone looks like and this idea of thin being good that there's this unintentional projection of that idea to kids, which is not a healthy approach. Um, Right. Now, can there be – so can there be people, kids, teens who are overweight and also healthy, meaning, you know, in adults – there are definitely people who are overweight, but they have great cholesterol levels. There's, you know, they're mm-hmm. nowhere near diabetic. They exercise, but they're they're bigger people, and that's okay yeah. because they're not actually hurting their bodies based on the numbers, et cetera. Does that hold for kids too? Well, I mean, you know, when you calculate BMI, BMI doesn't take into account muscle mass, for example. So, you know. Sometimes parents will come in upset because at school they they send a letter home saying, oh, your child's obese, you know, um, and just because they fall into the, the range. And, and, you know, that child could be a weightlifter and be all muscle. So obviously that child's not obese. So it's not an – it's really more of a screening tool. And I think if, if your child falls in that range, it's something you really have to discuss with your doctor and really take a look at the child. Um, but, you know, being overweight – even if you have a, a normal cholesterol and and you're quote unquote healthy, you know, having that extra weight makes it harder for kids to move. Um, it does affect their bone strength. You know, exercise in kids, it's not just for weight loss. I mean, exercise has the function to build muscle strength. It helps with your bone strength, you know, before puberty and early adolescence, that's when we're building all our bone, bone density um, for our life. So it's important for parents to understand that it's not just exercise to exercise to lose weight. I mean, exercise has a function in our body to strengthen, to strengthen the kids' bones and to strengthen their, to improve their overall health. Um, So I think you have to change the way you think of, you think of these things. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Well, we're going to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are speaking to pediatrician Dr. Elizabeth Vander, and there is more to come. Don't go away. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact the symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. Global Glory, that's the work of Dr. Marina McLean, COO of Global Glory, whose calling is to serve God. A first-generation British-born Londoner of Jamaican descent, Dr. McLean inherited the hunger for the word from her father, who was a Bible teacher. Growing up, her home was filled with missionaries from the Caribbean islands and America, and she travels the world preaching the gospel. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology and an honorary doctorate of divinity and Christian counseling from Friends International Christian University. Dr. McLean is also a songwriter and recording artist, and her songs are written during summits and conferences in the presence of God. She's recorded three worship albums to date and is in ministry for 28 years alongside her husband, Dr. Rennie McLean, who shares her passion. Visit www.globalglory.org or on Facebook at Global Glory. Call 866 244 5679 and feel the glory. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking to pediatrician Dr. Elizabeth Vander about healthy eating in kids. And anyone listening to this live or in the next, I guess, week and a half, two weeks, uh, we have Halloween coming up. What's your feeling on treats and also for this year in particular – What's your thinking about um, trick-or-treating and such vis-a-vis COVID? Yeah, I mean, the, the American Academy of Pediatrics has said that, you know, trick-or-treating and um, going house to house, picking up candy is a high-risk behavior. So, you know, that really has to be something that depends on your the, the rate of COVID in your area and personal decisions, too, for families who have higher risk um, families and choices. I mean, I think you can safely do some trick-or-treating, but you have to be, um, you know, careful not to eat anything that's unwrapped or keep candies away for a little while, you know, put them aside for a few days. Um, I don't think anyone really knows 100% (laughs) with COVID. Um, But it's definitely an unusual Halloween, and I think a lot of parents are going to be staying home. Yeah, probably. I mean, yeah. the flip side is I don't think anyone has gotten COVID from eating specifically. No. But no. but in theory, I guess if someone's there right before you and they coughed on their hand and then they stick their hand. I, I mean, you could play it out. But uh, oh, uh, I know so many now, unknowns with COVID. Seriously, should parents get their kids involved with things like grocery shopping? And if so, like, are there any certain thing, foods that, that are particularly healthy for kids? Yeah, I mean, you know, our kids' plates are supposed to be half fruits and vegetables. <laughs> and if you look at most kids' menus, um, they don't even have some fruits and vegetables um, or very little. You know, the usually the main part of the meal is carbohydrates. So, um I think if you really understood what kids are supposed to eat, they're really supposed to be eating lots of fruits and vegetables. And I think variety is key. Um, Involving them is awesome. You know, kids love to be involved and they feel important. And 
maybe coming up with new recipes or kind of cool recipes that they find using different fruits and vegetables um, and kind of, you know, making it accessible. I think I always tell patients, you know, if you have an apple in your house, no one picks it up to eat it. But as soon as you cut it up and put it on a plate, everyone wants a bite, you know. So I think what, <laughs> when you it's have true. something in the house, you know, cut up and you kind of put it in the middle of the table, everyone wants a piece you know, um, but no one grabs the apple to bite into it. So I think, you know, making food accessible to kids and being creative and making it fun is a great way to help kids try new food. Um, with little kids, um, I like to tell parents that kind of, they can keep like a little food notebook and they can um, write down, like, let's say they tried broccoli and they can kind of rate it and they can say a happy face if I like this, sad face if I didn't like it. And then that's it. Just try it. Like, say, I like this, I don't like it. All right. Kind of like a food critic, you know. And then at the end of the week, you can kind of look at your book and say, wow, look, I tried five new things. I liked three of them. I didn't like those, you know. Um, and kind of encouraging them and making it fun for them um, because that's how they're going to be more interested in trying things. And, you know, how you eat, too. I mean, if you're serving them vegetables, but you're not eating any vegetables yourself, you know, they're <laughs> not going to be too interested right. in their vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> we we try to like make things different like sp we made spaghetti squash and initially my right. kids were like no squash and then we put we like made it three ways or we you know one had red sauce one had yeah. like cinnamon sugar and I don't remember what the third one had but um and you know we had them like try it and see which one they liked the most rather than saying here's the one approach here's your one yeah exactly test I mean Admittedly, I'm not the biggest spaghetti squash fan, but it wasn't bad. <laughs> it wasn't terrible. Like you can also add like you can add different foods to your to your meals that you know you can add little vegetables just a little bit, like add a little bit here, add a little bit there, so they start getting used to the taste of things, um, even if they don't eat it. So like if you're making a red sauce, maybe add some vegetables to it, even if you don't serve it to them, so that they start to develop a taste for the different types of flavors. Um, that you're cooking with. But yeah, definitely in encouraging them to try different things, trying them different ways, like you said, is great because, yeah, like some kids like them raw with some dressing or some kids like them cooked or some them with butter or garlic or, you know. Um, but understanding that their plates are really supposed to be half fruits and vegetables, I think is one of the things that as Americans, I don't think, we, we do a very good job. <laughs> no. Well, with that in mind, a quick aside, and then I'll ask you a question. I put a lot of nutritional yeast on things because it's high in B12 and and it's vegan, which works for us. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it, it's like an easy way to get them some vitamins in there without them right. really knowing it. Um, now, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how much they love it, but nevertheless, <laughs> <laughs> nevertheless, I guess one last question I have is fruit. I, I mean, my kids love fruit, but I always get a little concerned that fruit has a lot of sugar. Is sugar based or fruit based sugar okay? Yeah, I mean, fruit has a lot of sugar, but um, if you eat whole fruit, it, you're, it's very hard to get too much of that kind of sugar. That's why um, we try to advocate against juicing because if you, you know, if you drink an eight ounce glass of fruit juice, you had to use a lot of fruits to get that glass. Um, so you're getting a lot of, sh a lot more sugar from that juice than you would be from eating one apple or eating one orange. Um, so yes, I mean, fruits have natural sugar, but they're not refined sugars that we get in like, snacks and, and processed foods and, and I think when you're looking at food labels that's what you have to look for you have to look for added sugars um, when they're adding sugars that should be kind of a red flag um, that it's not the, the kinds of sugars that you want in your body um, you know our diets are going to have some sugar you know but you always look for um, no added sugars look for the words like whole like whole grain um whole wheat instead of, you know, white flour, or white bread, white rice. Those are kinds of changes that you can teach kids early on. Only serve them those foods, 
you know, if you only serve them brown rice, only serve them whole wheat bread, you know, don't even buy white bread at home. That way they just get used to that. That's, they think that that's normal. Um, well, we only have two minutes left, but I do want to throw in one question. Do Is it okay for kids to have diet soda? Oh, no, I don't, I, we don't really advocate for um, um, artificial sweeteners in kids. So um, no diet, so no regular soda either, right? I mean, not routinely because no, it's so much no. sugar. Again, I mean, I usually tell parents water is number one, one you know, and obviously milk. After the age of, from one to two, kids should be having whole milk. But after the age of two, they really should be having fat-free or 2% milk. Um, and no more than one or two glasses a day. That's it. So well, really water is the most important thing in the house. I wouldn't even buy soda in the house. No, yeah. You know, no. again, what you do when you're out, you know, with your, you know, I usually if you want to have sweets when you go out or on the, on the weekend or something or have an ice cream or something, that's fine. But try not to have it in your house to decrease the, the chance that they're going to take, eat it or drink it. That's such great points. This has been such a wonderful show and so informative. Where can people find you online? Uh, I have a website. It's um, www.drvcares.com. And if they look at www.drvcares.com forward slash obesity and kids, they can actually go in there and get some ideas for their kids for their weight and some sample menus. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Elizabeth Vander, and thank you to our listeners. Remember, Wednesday, 1 p.m. every week. This has been an episode of MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network, TuneIn Radio, and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and until next time, be well, eat well, eat healthfully, enjoy life, wear a mask, please, and remain socially distant from others. Be, take care of yourself and your family, and um, let's try to reduce you know, COVID. Everybody has a part. And last but not least, thanks for listening. You've been listening to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Please join us each and every week for answers to the many challenging issues moms face today on the next episode of Dr. Carly's MD for Moms. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.